Well, first of all, welcome. I am uh, Don Oldenettle, serving as uh, Secretary of the NLSA Executive Committee, and just very proud to be able to introduce you today to Loving Shepherd Early Learning Center and to our speaker, um, Brenda. I, I did have the pleasure of meeting um, and actually sitting on the exemplary school visit in uh, Golden Valley. So we have many wonderful things to hear today, and uh, we'll go ahead and get started with prayer. Dear Lord, you are an awesome and amazing God, and we thank you that you have called us to serve you through the church and through school ministries. Lord, we thank you today for the ministry um, that exists to the, the youngest amongst us, those in our early childhood centers. Bless our speaker today as she shares her gifts and the gifts of their ministry in uh, at Loving Shepherd. And may the Lord prepare our hearts and our minds and uh, maybe bring around new uh, possibilities for our own ministries. Lord, we just thank you in your precious name. Amen. All right. Brenda has been the director of Golden Valley Lutheran Early Learning Shepherd, sorry, Loving Shepherd Early Learning Center in Golden Valley, Minnesota. Uh, for the last 12 years, she has been through the uh, NLSA accreditation process twice and uh, deserves a sincere round of applause because she has just learned that they have um, achieved accreditation through NACI. And those of you in the know know that uh, that's an arduous process in itself and something that worthy of uh, praise and, and recognition. So, Brenda, I'm going to turn this right over to you. God's blessings. Thank you, Don. Hi, everyone. Thanks for taking time this afternoon to be part of this webinar. As Don said, my name is Brenda Lovehog. This webinar stuff is new to me, but I'm looking forward to sharing a few best practices that we believe are critical to the success of our center. Before I jump into them, let me give you a little background on our center. We are located in a first ring suburb outside of Minneapolis, not too far from a north-south highway on an east-west artery from Minneapolis. We are licensed by the Minnesota Department of Human Services and have been in existence for just over 23 years. We are licensed to provide care for 90 children from 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. Monday through Friday year-round and we are currently operating near full, full capacity. Our um, staff consists of 19 full-time teachers, one part-time teacher, and a full-time cook. We also have a full-time custodian who is shared by the church and the center. Our families come from various ethnic and religious backgrounds. In addition to being accredited by NLSA, um, like Don said, we recently received our accreditation from NACI. When doing the self-studies, you have the opportunity to learn a lot about your program. Some immediate feedback that we received and would like to start with revolves around communication. One may ask, how does a church-sponsored child care center stand out from its peers in a metropolitan area with many alternative choices? There are probably many different answers to this question depending on which parent you ask on any given day, but I suspect that a common denominator among our families starts with building trust through various communication channels. As you may know, first impressions can be lasting impressions. When a prospect makes an initial call or an email to our center, a systematic process begins with two simple words, thank you. Be prepared to thank people for showing an interest in your program. It tends to lighten the conversation right away. The next piece should be obvious, but bears mentioning. Be ready with good listening skills. Each person that you talk with will have differing amounts of information that they are starting with. Be ready to answer questions they have and are ready, and be ready to ask them questions that will help them to begin to understand the program and the benefits and the cost. I think it's important to get as many benefits clearly understood before jumping into the cost because we are not the least expensive alternative in our area. As the conversation begins to conclude, you want, to, um, you want the prospective parent focused on the benefits of the program and want to come in for a tour. 
At this point, a seed has been planted that the tour would last approximately 30 to 45 minutes and that during the tour, we'll go through our parent handbook, highlighting important policies and answering questions. To assist in the process, I encourage parents to schedule the tour during times that I know the children will be active. I try to avoid nap time. I also identify who will best handle the appointment. When a prospective family arrives, they are greeted either by me or our assistant director, Heidi Clipperton, who is also the lead infant teacher. This is especially important when an infant family is seeking care because Heidi can more thoroughly answer questions about that program. I like to say that she's the expert on the infant room. Due to the location of my office, we often meet with the prospective family in a quieter conference room located in the church building. That helps to avoid interruptions and distractions like phone calls and crying babies. As a sidebar, the creation of a thorough handbook for parents provides the written communications that most parents are actively looking for. It is often the piece that provides the answers that parents are looking for and information that they didn't know they should be looking for when evaluating child care centers. After going through the parent handbook and having answered their questions, we end with a tour of the whole program, spending the most time in the child's initial classroom and introducing staff members as encountered. At the end of the tour, parents are reminded of the registration process, which includes completing and returning the registration form and the non-refundable registration fee, which will either enroll them, depending upon their needs and available space, or in many cases, secure them on the waiting list. Once a start date is established, the lead teacher is responsible for contacting the family for an enrollment conference, or as I like to refer to it as a getting to know you conference, where additional paperwork is given out and a more in-depth tour is given. During this time, our lead teachers begin deepening the relationship by asking some additional questions to help provide a smooth transition into the program, as well as collecting information, which would include any known allergies and any special interests. When we, sh we then share food allergy information with the cook and put both a name and a photo of the child on a chart that can be easily seen by our cook and staff members when preparing and serving meals to the children. As part of our commitment to continuing the communication process, each classroom has a personal daily sheet in which the teachers can record pertinent information concerning the child's day, including both positive and constructive behavior modifications that may be needed, food intake, toileting information, and sleeping times. The teacher also includes something that, that the child enjoyed doing during the day so that parents have a conversation starter that can that they can talk with their child about um, specifically um, that they did during the day and not get the often heard response, I don't know what I did or nothing when asked what they did during the day. The written communication doesn't stop there. Each Monday, the lead teachers send out a weekly newsletter that touches on the planned activities for the week. These are not only sent home and posted in the classroom, but we also post the newsletter on a private Shutterfly account. This page has pictures, menus, and an event calendar that again promotes good communication between staff and parents. Teachers understand that two of the most important points of the day are at drop-off and pickup times. Parents are looking for reassurance that their child is happy and well cared for. These are great opportunities for our staff to build relationships with individual families. Examples include asking about planned weekend or holiday activities, and then later asking follow-up questions. As it has been said, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. I have to say at this point, this is a huge strength of our teachers. Why is this so important? Because these are the cues that offer insights into what's really going on with a family, and then being able to potentially minister to a particular need. You might be surprised, but one thing that we do that may not be commonplace 
is provide each of our lead teachers with professionally printed business cards so that they can hand it to the parents they regularly serve. It's a small thing, but it subtly reminds parents that they are working with professionals and the lead teachers can gently encourage families to contact them with news that may directly or indirectly impact their child and his or her well-being. Like most schools, we see tremendous value in conducting semi-annual conferences. These conferences are designed to review the past six months and how the child is developing as a whole child. Parents and teachers formally review developmental checklists that have been completed and go through portfolios that are accumulating to help parents understand the ways in which their child is growing and developing. They also use this time to discuss concerns and to set goals for the next six months. So what is our approach to encouraging parents to sign up for conferences? How do we accommodate families with more than one child in the program? The lead teachers and I work together to determine which dates and times conferences will be offered, and then we print out a schedule of the times available and place the sign-up sheets on a central bulletin board that all the parents can see. This allows parents to sign up early and coordinate back-to-back -back conferences in different rooms if needed. To get the most out of, con out of the conference, we offer conferences in the afternoon so that children can remain in childcare while meeting with the teacher. In instances where the parents may be divorced, our teachers will arrange to do separate conferences if necessary or requested. One thing that I want to share with you is that I make it a point to make myself available during conferences, but I have seen firsthand how much the parents trust and respect the teachers, especially after their first conference together. I occasionally stop by to monitor how things are going, but again, see the value in letting the lead teachers conduct the meeting. Candidly, it doesn't hurt to have staff who've been in our program for a while either. During conferences, we intentionally set out beverages and light snacks for our families. The gesture is very much appreciated and doesn't have to be overly complex. As the director, I make it a point to greet each family by name and point out the treats that are available. During this time, I can also drop in on a conference as needed. As part of our communication process, we have purchased a service called One Call Now that sends out a message to preferred phones. The program allows us to record a single message and let an automated dialer call all the telephone numbers we have assigned to the program to contact our parents. This program is great because I can also segment calls to parents in specific classrooms as well. In case you're wondering, we have found these warm, gentle reminders help drive attendance at our conferences and other family activities that we promote outside the normal hours of operation. Let me fast forward for a moment. Here's something you may or may not have thought about. Do you have a system that helps foster a continued relationship with the people you have helped? At Loving Shepherd Early Learning Center, we keep the names and addresses of our alumni. Usually, at or around Thanksgiving, I write a short letter to our alumni families and share things that are new or may be interesting to them. In addition, this communication gives them the opportunity to make a tax-deductible gift to our endowment fund. As you can see, the common thread of communication is found in almost everything we do. If you are just starting to make improvements, be patient with yourself and your expectations. Good systems do not just create themselves overnight. I believe that the bigger challenge comes in helping develop staff so that they fully understand that they need to be deliberately paying attention to the systems that are effectively working. Your job then is to regularly train them and to follow the program so that it becomes natural. I believe that your staff are the best eyes and ears you have. I also believe that they need to speak up when significant communication breakdowns occur. While it often isn't, it should be second nature to them to take time to share the concern or concerns with you in a timely manner. When communications are minimized and regular systems are followed, it is my belief that you will see the quality of your program increase. 
this in turn should allow the leadership to begin to focus on other areas that it has a passion for. With that said, let's shift gears from the best practice of building effective communication into your program to the second subject that is near and dear to my heart, Outreach Ministries. Each week, I collect tuition from the parents who use our center. Some would say that our business is to provide a safe, nurturing learning environment from which a child can leave and enter a primary school ready for the next phase of their life. The person who would give me that description of our business would only be partially correct. In Volume 3, Number 4 of the January 2013 article put out by NLSA, our mission statement is clearly stated that our existence is to provide Christian nurture. As part of any accreditation process, we had to ask ourselves, how are we doing in this area? I would challenge you to step back and ask yourself the same question and see if you feel the same passion that I feel when I talk about outreach. Outreach does not happen in a vacuum. Good or bad, it happens and it impacts other areas of your program your church, your community, and sometimes beyond what you even know. What I'm asking you to consider today is to think broadly about who is an advocate for helping our ministry and who are your roadblocks. I have to be candid again and say that the, the success we have seen in our center does not flow from directives of my office. I want to tell you about some individuals who are on staff at our congregation and tell you about some of the things they have, that we have done together in a coordinated effort so that we could make the largest impact with the resources God has provided us. I'm not sure about your working relationship with other leadership, especially the pastor, but during my tenure, our former pastor, Phil Wagner, and our current pastor, Rex Rennie, along with members of our congregation, have fundamentally supported our mission. All have encouraged me personally to share opportunities that I see surfacing and have encouraged me to dedicate time and energy into getting new ideas off the ground. I will say this with all due respect to those listening, that I have seen political battlegrounds where the mutual respect with Christian adult leaders grinds to a halt and the ownership or credit becomes more important than the opportunity to create an outreach ministry. So with some humility, I'd like to help you get to know the people that have impacted what has been accomplished at Loving Shepherd Early Learning Center. I believe that the health of a congregation begins with the pastor. Rex Rennie accepted a call to Golden Valley Lutheran Church in 2008 when he and his wife uprooted from Appleton, Wisconsin. They have made many acquaintances during his ministry in various congregations that he proudly and openly discusses. When you engage him in conversation, you can tell that the passion inside of him is slightly less focused on the existing members of the congregation and more focused on finding ways to get the word out to those who do not know Jesus as their Lord and Savior because of the invitation of the gospel that has not been planted. When I say that, I mean that anyone can share their faith, and Rex often reminds all of us about that. As it, is meant, as it was mentioned earlier, being part of an urban setting in the shadow of Minneapolis, the people who knock on our door sometimes come to our center with little or no clear understanding of our mission. Again, we look to intentionally weave the love of Jesus throughout our program. As part of the enrollment process, we gather specific pieces of information for communication and reporting purposes. Beyond that, we strategically use a portion of the information that we collect about a newly enrolled child and their family to set in motion the planting of gospel seeds. <clears throat> Pastor Rex has made it clear that he wants to support our efforts. You might ask, what kinds of things has he done for your program? First, he is sensitive to the fact that not all our families may be Christians. When I learn that a family may be new to the area or may not have a church home, I coordinate with him or our church secretary so that special contacts can be made to introduce him and Golden Valley Lutheran. In conjunction with contacting non-churched and new families to Loving Shepherd Early Learning Center with a phone call, 
Our congregation sends out a warm introductory letter and provides a token gift bag to the family as well. These are small gestures that in, them, in themselves could be left undone and maybe no one would notice. But because they are done, the joy of having one more person accept Jesus Christ as their personal Savior means that it really needs to be done and should be part of our best practices. On a lighter note, Rex is a grandfather multiple times over. He loves children. He enjoys getting down at their level, and he is part of our regular rotation, not only for Sunday morning children's sermons, but also the center's weekly chapel rotation. That is fine, but there are eight of us in the rotation for chapel, and so I had thoughts about creating another opportunity to take his love for children and expand it in a special way directly to the children enrolled at our center. Since I was a young girl, I have noticed that good Lutherans always find a way to involve food when they celebrate or witness. My thought was to test a simple new program where a special meal happens once a month that the kids would remember and want to share with their families and look forward to in the coming months. <coughs> we discussed ideas that could be simple, cost-effective, and that most every child would love. As it turns out, the idea to have pizza delivered to our center was the option that kids wanted. We began Pizza with Pastor about two years ago. The feedback we've had has been positive, and we see this continuing into the future. I believe the bottom line is that when you see a gift or talent that God has given to a member of your team, be bold and ask them to step up and try something new with you. On that thought, I'd like to segue to another person on our congregational staff who hasn't been afraid to work shoulder to shoulder with me. We talk about each other's programs and we look for ways to change up material that has been successful before but may be starting to become a little stale. Wait a minute. Let me tell you a little something before I go much further. If you didn't know this before, you can recall that you've heard it here first. Here's a little piece of advice I offer. When you're talking about someone, especially in the Lutheran church, really anyone, be careful on not to be overly critical or gossipy about someone. Scripture warns us of this. Having been doing this for over 20 years, I'm amazed more often than I, am, than I can actually believe how often a single comment or discussion can inadvertently find its way back to the other person because they are related to or know someone that you are commenting on. I think they call this six degrees of separation. What I'm saying is it's a small Lutheran world out there. Give me a moment to elaborate. My oldest son is an actuary, and he studies complex math and applies it to his, to his work. Wait, I promise not to go off on a wild tangent here. What I really should do is ask him what the probability of two young public high school graduates from a small class of 42 graduates in a small American town going to church work, going into church work would be. Wait, there's more. And they end up being called to the same congregation and work together for 14 years. This is my comrade, Jennifer Hall. We are both graduates of a small rural Minnesota school you know the expression, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas? We have a very similar pact. Anyway, Jennifer is the Director of Family Ministries and is responsible for the ministries and programs that take place with families and young children in Golden Valley Lutheran. She has things like Sunday School, Vacation Bible School, and specific programs that happen prior to Christmas and Easter, which have a carnival-like feel and tend to draw from both the congregation and the community. We call them Christmas Fair and Easter Fair. Can you begin to see how my program can feed her various programs? Through active coordination and planning, families from our center get invited to participate in these programs. Do other non-church-based centers offer this type of experience? Probably not. The synergy created to generate more numbers in Jen's program results in a more successful program for her more positive contacts, and in some instances, feeds into church membership and regular Sunday school attendance. On the flip side, 
When parents have great experiences outside our program, they begin to feel comfortable and welcome in general. When they feel welcome, they attend more events sponsored by either the church or the Early Learning Center, and they tend to talk about their experiences with people in their, at work and in their neighborhoods. They become walking referrals. Remember, they will talk, whether positive or negative, so you need to build good programs and pay attention to the details. What have I learned? One of our best practices is that when Jen and I intentionally work together down to the last detail to help provide each family with an outstanding experience that they can think back on and are willing to share with others without being prompted to do so, we are successful. Some of you might be thinking at this time that these types of activities are just marketing gimmicks. You might question using the word outreach. However, I believe that those that think of this strictly in marketing terms need to only revisit the concept of deliberate sharing of the gospel with those that need to hear the word and need to see it in action. God wants us to actively share our faith. When we, need, when we plan to do so intentionally, we can evaluate, measure, and make plans to continue, modify, or eliminate. What I am more focused on saying today is that if you have someone that you can trust who has the responsibilities that can complement your activities, take the time to foster the common ground with a Christ-centered attitude and you will be amazed at what can happen. I'd like to share another story with you. This past year, Jen was ready for a new challenge, so she presented the idea of a block party to the church leadership. They gave her the blessing to go forward to draw up a program that would celebrate the existence of the congregation in the community by inviting households to the surrounding area to a day-long block party that would start with an outdoor worship service and promote fun family activities that would be free to members of the community. The event also included invitations to vendors and solicitations to local businesses to provide prizes for the event. The year-long planning of this event came to fruition on a Sunday afternoon in September under beautiful, clear blue skies and above average temperatures. Approximately 600 individuals were counted and registered, and the majority of the congregation found itself involved in some fashion. How was Loving Shepherd Early Learning Center involved? We were one of the booths or vendors, and our families were all invited to attend. My point is this. Someone you know wants to get some of the big rock projects going. You need to be ready to support them and find ways for them to support you. I believe that both programs will be better for it. So I will be my own devil's advocate at this point and ask myself, what are we doing to help those who need our help? What are we doing to model and teach our children to do more than eat, sleep, and use up resources of the planet. Certainly, there must be more, and there is. God has richly, richly blessed me personally and our center. There is another person on our church staff who has a passion to care for shut-ins, the elderly, the sick, and the hungry. I'd like to introduce you to Cindy Inselman, our Director of Care Ministries. As part of Cindy's efforts, members of our congregation have regularly have regular monthly opportunities to extend the hands and feet of Christ to segments of the community that are desperately looking for a mission partner. Our local food shelf, called PRISM, refers to Golden Valley Lutheran as a partner. We have a visible collection point where families of both the center and the church can donate food. These collections are then transported to the local center, and families in need can shop for the things they are in need of in a respectful manner. We are able to talk about this with the children and have selected it because each child can understand what it feels like to be hungry. Interestingly, PRISM is more than a food shelf. They sponsor a clothing store and help recondition cars to be sold to families that are needing these services. They do a great job of taking gifted resources and screening to get the resources and education to local families. This month, January, usually our coldest month of the year, we are again coordinating a drive to collect gloves, hats, 
mittens and scarves for this same organization. Since we have young children in our program, we have chosen to participate in a program that our families can relate to and can choose to support. We are, or they are located right across the street from us. We believe that the Minneapolis Crisis Nursery is another worthy cause. Young parents and those needing a temporary helping hand with their children often seek help from the center. We want parents to be aware of the opportunity to be the hands of Jesus and show kindness to a family they will likely never know through this program. We have collected money, diapers, and wet, wet wipes for use at the crisis nursery. Interestingly, we work with our congregation through Cindy to identify members of our congregation and families in our early learning center that could benefit from an extra helping hand. The congregation provides a dinner to families with a new baby, Christmas gifts to families going through financial hardship, visits to the hospital during surgeries and long stays, and they also support families during the loss of a loved one. At the beginning of each academic year, when stores are promoting sales of school-related supplies, we encourage members of the congregation and families of our Early Learning Center to open their hearts up to children who would otherwise go without basic school supplies like pencils, paper, scissors, and glue. We work with Lutheran World Relief to promote this because kids understand these concrete items and parents can easily explain how they are helping other children. During the summer, we share information about St. Jude's Children's Hospital, and we have an annual organized trikathon that we use not only as a fun activity, but also a fundraiser for the hospital. We use time in the classroom to explain why we will be writing and how these children are afflicted with cancer and other life-threatening health problems. Again, we are intentionally focusing on a topic that we feel kids will understand. They can empathize with a sick child because they know what it is like to be sick. One of the busier times of the year happens shortly after Thanksgiving. Our congregation puts up a giving tree. Anyone can donate a requested gift for a specific age and gender child. When the new gift has been placed under the giving tree, a glass ornament is hung in celebration of the donation. The immediate visual feedback before Christmas of a well-decorated tree allows all to know that generous givers have stepped up once again. It, is al it also provides a gentle visual thank you to those who know they have been part of the giving tree. We remind children about the tree because they know what it is like to get, the, to get a gift and can begin to assemble thoughts of what it would be like not to have any gifts under the Christmas tree. I would like to just take a moment to give a shout out to one more organization. Franklin Graham has continued the work of his father, the Reverend Billy Graham, in a program called Operation Christmas Child. If you're not familiar with it, the gist of the program is to encourage pe uh, people to show love toward a person they will never meet in the form of a shoebox filled with items that the donor chooses to gift. This can include small toys, games, toiletries, and even certain types of hard candy. The boxes are inspected to make sure that inappropriate things are censored and removed. These are collected and sent to a local processing center and distributed to specific regions of the world. The undertaking is massive and hundreds of thousands of boxes are delivered annually. Golden Valley Lutheran Church and Loving Shepherd Early Learning Center try to plan our events and activities through Acts 1-8. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all of Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. We believe that Jesus wants our center to think beyond locally giving of our treasures. We believe going to the ends of the earth needs to be included in our modeling. If you are looking for ways to expand your passion towards missions, I hope these ideas that we include as part of our best practices can be incorporated into your heart for missions. To inter introduce these staff members to families, let me share an example of something we started doing a couple years ago and have found it to be successful, appreciated, and fun. The center has an annual open house at the beginning of the school year. 
It is not the traditional open house where the center is open to the community and is looking to register and enroll children. This is for our families who are ready and um, who are already enrolled, some new to LSELC, but an opportunity to meet everyone. We start with supper, usually pizza, then each family receives a passport. They need to visit all the classrooms, meet the teachers, and in the classrooms there will be an activity for the families to do before they can get their passport stamped. They, are all, they also have to visit our cook and custodian and the different church staff, Pastor Rex, Jennifer, Cindy, and our church secretary, Chris, at their booths. They all stamp the passport and have a small gift for the child or the family. And when the passport is completed, the family puts their name in a drawing to win one of three $50 gift certificates, which can be used toward a week of tuition. Finally, I would like to share a third concept that I feel needs to be included in our time together today. The topic of promoting professionalism and minimizing turnover within our center stems from a couple of core competencies that I feel have contributed to the honor of receiving exemplary status this year. The first belief is to surround yourself with individuals who understand your mission and who are able to contribute in a unique perspective based on their experience, education, or combination of the two. Selecting the correct board members is not always an easy task, but certainly a process that, if done correctly, can yield an action-oriented committee. I believe that poor board selection can result in paralysis or significant conflicts which become difficult to operate from. I also believe that melding together the wrong group of people can be disastrous for an organization. So what am I looking for? We have found the following types of knowledgeable people to be, to be effective on a school board. A supportive parent representative, a savvy financial person with a business perspective, an educator, we've had early childhood people, we've had elementary teachers. And right now, I'm fortunate to have a member with experience from the Minnesota Department of Ed. We've had a lawyer, a supportive congregation member. Selecting a board chair from the representatives who is organized and is a good communicator is also very important. Limiting your board to a handful of people helps to keep discussions on track and allows for each member to contribute to the success and ownership needed to make things work. Having regular meetings with a predefined agenda that is sent out in advance usually makes for better, more efficient meetings, too. I would also say that in conjunction with being supportive, selected board members need to be realistic, open to new concepts, and be ready to empower the administrator to act on their counsel. They can be visionary, but should allow the director to make decisions how to best administer. The other aspect of running your program is like a business, sorry, the other aspect of running your program like a business is to recognize the unique resources that bring people to your center. The second piece is tied to a personal bias of mine. I am a believer that a strong program is built around rewarding staff for investing in themselves and their profession. People have asked me how we've been able to retain quality teachers when the industry is full of turnover. I understand that at certain points, our staff may need to move into something other than what they are currently doing. That can be for many good reasons, like wanting to start a family of their own, relocation, or going to school to further their own education. My goal is that if they are ready to make a change, that it is for the right reason. Don't get me wrong. Sometimes the person who interviewed turns out not to be a good fit for whatever reason. I do believe that it is just as important for the cohesiveness of the other staff to make decisive cho changes when corrective measures do not alleviate the observed problem. However, in order to promote retention and professionalism, we have created a fair pay scale and benefit package that helps us to be competitive based on education and or experience so that the staff we choose to hire look forward to coming to work with the children 
and they know that I am fighting to provide them with the best possible benefit package that is economically possible. We have done other things to follow the guidelines as set forth by the Minnesota Department of Human Services, but when we have openings, we try to interview candidates that have values that align with our mission statement, and I remind each candidate that they represent the foundation of our success and that parents are counting on them for consistent, comforting care in both formal learning and play. We are open year-round, but operate off of a modified school calendar to easily transition pre-kindergarten graduates of the program into a kindergarten program elsewhere each September. Around the Labor Day holiday, we also help galvanize the cohesiveness of our staff with dedicated in-service training and then give them a paid day to make ready their new classroom. To review, our center believes that the best practices of good communication tied to the desire to be mission outreach oriented and staffed with the best qualified people you can find and train becomes the basis for a successful program. Are there any final questions? Okay, I'm going to go ahead, uh, Brenda, and just kind of unmute everybody, and we'll let you guys ask questions if you have. Um, also, you can chat your questions in the in the chat box to the bottom left of your screen. What um, Sue is asking, what what does fair pay look like? We have a public school right across the street from us, and so our board chair contacted the school district and asked um, what they would pay um, people with, uh, this, with specific qualifications um, of our teachers that we had here at the time. And so we have um, made our pay scale comparable to the uh, public school district that we're located in. I had a question about the, the presentation that you've just given, the PowerPoint itself. Mm -hmm. um, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it, and I'm heading off to a Board of Ed um, meeting myself here in just a little bit, and I was wondering if this presentation will be available with um, either via email or video, if it would be available to share with our Board of Education. Tom, can you talk to that, how they can find it? Yeah, um, it, what we do is um, we'll edit it because we've been recording it, um, and we'll edit that so that we edit kind of the, the beginning part where there's, you know, chit-chat and all that stuff um, out, and then at the end if there's any extra stuff that's unnecessary, we edit all that out. Um, and then the link will go up on the Lutheran School website. Okay. However, um, if, you'd, if you'd like, if you need something um, more quickly, um, you, you can get the uned, unedited version um, just by by sending me an email, and I can I can send you the link to the presentation. Okay. Thomas, this is this is Terry talking. I just wanted to to know where to go to get the archived versions of any webinar. You go to luthed.org. That's the lo load in page for the Lutheran School Portal. Luthed.org. All of the webinars that are are have been presented this year, including this presentation are located at luthed.org. You don't have to be a portal member. You just go to that address and you'll see in the right hand column a, an entire listing of all of the webinars that have been presented this year. Uh, you just click on the link and it'll take you right to that. And Thomas, usually it's about what, maybe a week or so before that those are edited and put up there, is that correct? Yeah, that's about right. It usually takes mm -hmm. about a week to get them cleaned up. Terry, I'm just going to spell it. L U T H E D. Maybe you can type it in the chat box, Don. Oh, that'd be great. All right. Good, I good idea. Um, Brenda, this is Judy. And when you're talking about the, the pay scale, I just think that's incredible. Does your congregation support your center, or do you, are you expected to try and be self-supporting? We're self-supporting. You are. We are. That's why earlier, in, 
earlier in the presentation, I said we're not one of the cheapest um, centers in the metro area. Uh huh. Um, I, this may not mean anything to any of you, but for a full-time infant, we charge $315 a week. <gasps> oh, wow. <laughs> I didn't have a comment to that one. But that's in the metro area. I mean, we're not – we may be in the general ballpark um, out here in the west metro. Um, my – I'll say my biggest competitors are the ELEA girls and their staff. I have three of them within five miles. What's ELEA? The Evangelical Lutheran oh, Churches. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> They're good girls. They they really are. <laughs> Any other questions? I was wondering, uh, this is Julie, and I was wondering, um, are you meant just as a a full um, daycare center, or do you also do preschool classes that are shortened versions in each day? We are full child care. Okay. We have um, an in, uh, infant room with 16 babies, a young toddler room with 12 children, older toddlers with 14, young preschoolers at 19, and our pre-kindergarten room is at 20. So do you offer an option if people are just wanting a um, short period of time, just as a preschool opportunity where we are be home moms? or Our only part-time option is um, two, three days a week. That We don't do a half part day. Okay. Now, also, I know that you talked about the communication tool, the daily one that your teachers use. Yep, um, on the Shutterfly. Is um, is that anything that's a, that you can uh, that you post anywhere? I mean, examples of that. Um, it's all passworded, so that parents, not just anybody, can go in and see the pictures because the teachers have taken pictures of the kids in the classroom and the activities <laughs> that they're doing. So, for privacy, it's passworded. Is that one of the Shutterfly Share sites? Yes. Okay. Well, Brenda, you can relax. You can relax now. You did an incredible job. Thanks, Judy. Sue, oh. you have a question if I'm a full-time director? Yes. yes. And most of our teachers are full-time, um, and the reason we do that is it just offers more opportunities for them to take a smaller group of kids and do more one-on-one -on -one with them instead of having a group of 20 or a group of 14 toddlers with two teachers. They can do right. more one-on-one -on -one stuff with a smaller group of children. Oh, it's commendable. This, this is Judy, uh, Brenda. What's your ratio in your in your various rooms for teacher children? Okay, um, having in in our infant room, we huh? run at a one to four. But okay. having just gone through NACI accreditation, they require to have a staff person in the sleeping room at all times. Uh -huh. Our infant program is located in our ch in our church parsonage. And so we have had to hire an additional staff person to be in the sleep room at all times because it, our sleep rooms are two of the house or the bedrooms in the house. So we have yet another person sitting in the sleep room while the kids are sleeping, and which is basically in an infant room all day long. Yes, <laughs> mm -hmm. definitely. Okay. Um, and then we go on to our toddler room. Our young toddler room is one to six. Our older toddler room is one to seven. Our young preschool room is one to nine. And our uh, pre-K room is one to ten. Hey, thank you. Yep, and let me just put up my final screen here. Um, there's my contact information. Uh, 
If anybody has questions that they want to contact me later, I wish each of you the very best as you review your best practices and consider what you can do differently to make your program the best it can be. Thank you, Brenda. It was amazing. Nice it job. Was. Thank you Thank very you. much. Yep. Thanks, Brenda. Mm-hmm. Thanks, Brenda, for being with us.